Welcome to the Wildcast, back again for the Top 10 NBA Small Forwards episode. I believe it's episode 15. At some point, I'm just going to start losing track, let's be honest. But we are on the Top 10 Small Forwards episode. Hello again, this is me from the future. Uh, I apologize that this wasn't uploaded on Friday. It is a day late. I forgot to hit upload on the uh, video, so it just sat there unpublished and I didn't hit upload. So my apologies for that. Anyways, back to the list. Now, I know I've been saying this for pretty much every single list I've done so far, but I'm serious this time. I am serious. This was definitely top to bottom the hardest one I've had to do yet. Like I, I sat here for a good amount of time trying to figure out who to put where on this list. And honestly, I still don't know if I have it correct in my mind. But these are just the names that made sense to me. These are the names. This is the order that made – this is what made most sense in my head. And there's a million reasonings behind all of this. And – Honestly, again, at the end of the day, this is all preference. This was my preference. This is my preferences of how the players played this season. Um, and I'm not even kidding. As I am opening this podcast, I realize that I totally forgot to put a name on this list entirely. And he's going on right now. But, I, again, there's so many names in the small forwards list that it was really hard. Because I feel like all of these guys have top 10 potential, right? Um, Every single one of them has top 10 potential. And it's really a range of how you value each one. And I can't believe that I forgot this guy. Um, We'll get to who I forgot once I get to him. But anyways, we can open with the honorable mentions. Um, There's three players here that I have that just missed out that... I think on other people's list might actually make it one in specific, but I just don't like the season that he had at all. So I just left him off the list. Um, it's not this guy, but the, one of the men, one of the men that I have on this uh, honorable mentions part is OG on a um, all defensive team for the first time in his career this season, uh, 17 points per game, five rebounds, two assists, great efficiency out of him the Raptors had a decent season um it was really just a solid year for OG Ananobi and I had him in my 10 spot but as I said before like 20 seconds ago I forgot a name so he got bumped out of the 10 spot and now he's here on the honorable mentions but I do think that OG had a really great season and the stats don't show it but what does show is the all defensive team what does show is the leading the league in steals at 1.9, uh, 0.7 blocks, uh, 67 games played. He's durable. He's there every single night on the defensive end, consistent there, uh, consistent at the offensive end, 17 points with um, 47% from the field, 38% from three. Great percentages from him. I, I feel like he had a really, really solid season, and he deserved to be on the 10th spot. But again, literally just got bumped off. Another honorable mention, and this is another guy um, uh, that I really wanted to see in the 10 spot. And I picked him up for my fantasy team this year. Um, It's Keldon Johnson. Now, the reason why he's outside of the top 10 is strictly because the Spurs were, what, the the second worst team in the league? Like, this, the Spurs were not good. Keldon Johnson, however, put up 22 points, 5 rebounds, and 3 assists. 45% from the field and 33% from the three. Both of those percentages are career lows for him, but that was because he was attempting 17 shots a game, which was a career high by a mile for him. Um, Outrageous scoring from a guy that really nobody thought could lead a team like this, but granted, he didn't really lead him to much. He led him to, what is this, 22 wins? But, honestly, it's still a really good season for him. And I'm excited to what he can show next season. Um, I think him and Webb and Yama can put a lot of games together. And I think, honestly, I could see this team. It's tough to say. And I will have another video after I'm done with these top tens on where with the record of each team's. But, 
this this Spurs team is so weird to rank, right? Because you have Webinyama, who is projected to be this astonishing player that we, nobody's ever seen before and nobody knows how they're going to perform. And then you have Keldon Johnson here, the right-hand man, who's proved himself and averaged 22 points per game in a season. Um, they, ha- they had 22 wins last season. Realistically, every other team in the league got better. So can they get to 30 wins? Probably. Will they? Probably not, because every other team got better. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still Kelvin Johnson had a great season, um, statistics wise. He's there, and I had to mention his name strictly because of the statistics. But yeah, I don't, I don't think he makes the top ten list and any anybody's top ten list, and it's just because of the record that they had, and it was just poor. But what do you expect from a team like that? Um, the third name I have on the honorable mentions was now, okay, before I say this name, this was the guy that I think I, a lot of people would have on the list strictly because that we know what he can be. He has been a great player in the past and in the past he's deserved this top 10 list undoubtedly, undisputably, but I do my rankings off of their season that they just finished the 2022-2023 NBA season Chris Middleton had an awful season it was terrible from him from his standards like 15 points per game four rebounds and five assists is not bad like it's not terrible but for Chris Middleton standards that's it's bad 43% from the field 31% from three I believe that's a career that's a career low since his rookie year he also shot 31% his rookie year where he played 27 games, which is less than what he played this year, 33 games. Um, only started 19 of them. It's He wasn't really there to prove himself. I'm sure if he wasn't injured, he would be on this list. But 33 games played, and those 33 games, you had one of the worst. The, it, wasn't, it wasn't good. It wasn't pretty. But... I mean, I have to say his name because we all know what he can be. We all know what he's capable of. And hopefully next season he can get back here so I can put his name back in the conversation and I got more decision-making to do. But anyways, this gets us into our top 10. At number 10 is the one and only Franz Wagner. 18.6 points per game, four rebounds, three assists, 48% from the field, 36% from three his second year in the NBA was incredible. Of course, he's on the Orlando Magic, so it's kind of like Keldon Johnson. However, however, he shared the court with Paolo Bancaro. The Magic had 34 wins. They were very close to being at that 500 range, but uh, uh, how many games were they back? They were six games out of that 500 range. But Franz Wagner was there. He was there, and I think next season he's going to blow up even more. This is 80 games played, by the way. He played 80 games of the season. And that is one stat that I think is overlooked when you rank players, right? Because per- me personally, when I look up these players, I go, I look at their, first thing I do is look at their stats, right? So I look every single player up in basketball reference. And what is the first stat you see? It's games played. And when, when I'm doing these rankings, I see that Chris Middleton played 33. And I'm saying, like, he can't be on a top 10. You cannot be a top 10 in the league and only play 33 games. I see Franz Wagner at 80. And I'm like, this guy was averaging 18 points per game for 80 games? That's impressive. That is impressive. Um, From a second-year player, it was great. Great performance all around from him. He had a, I believe, 38 point per game, which is pretty good for him. Uh, Next year, he's going to do even better. And I'm ready for it. And I'm ready to see Franz shoot up this list. And we'll see if he can compete. Um, Now, at my nine spot, I kind of threw him here out of panic. I think he deserves... This is the guy I forgot. I threw him here out of panic. And I think he might deserve higher. I will check quick because I'm going to do some last... This is some last second uh, list editing right here. We'll see what... um, I am going to put him above. Okay. Never mind. Number nine is where I'm going to put Andrew Wiggins. Now, again, this this may be a little bit controversial. 
right? Because I just said that Chris Middleton doesn't deserve to be on the list because he played 33 games. And Andrew Wiggins only played 37 regular season games. However, he played every single game in the playoffs. He was there for the back end of the season, and he averaged 17 points per game. He averaged a block. He averaged a steal. He averaged two assists, six rebounds. Great efficiency, 46% from the field. Um, I mean, and his regular season stats for those 37 games aren't even bad. 17 points, five rebounds, two assists, 47% from the field, 40% from three. It's, of course, we know Andrew Wiggins was going through the whole season with those uh, personal reasons. Nobody actually knew why he was missing games. We knew he wasn't hurt. We knew he was just out of the team. Um, so I felt, I, I think I felt more like he deserved to be up here because of his playoff performance. And, of course, we all know what happened to the Bucks. I bounced the first round and Chris Middleton wasn't there. But, I mean, the reason why, a, a huge reason why the Warriors won the championship in 2022 and the whole reason why they beat the Kings this year in that first round was because of Andrew Wiggins. And his, the heart that he's got is, is so impactful. He's so impactful for this team. And... I put him. I I just moved him one spot down. I had him at eight, but this guy I forgot at the beginning of the show was I. I have to put him higher too, but it's it's really more than the stats for Andrew Wiggins. We all know what he brings to the court in the uh, hustle aspect, and he, he's really just there to provide heart for the team. And yeah, I, thirty-seven games. I know, but he was there for the playoffs where Chris Middleton wasn't. He was there and healthy for the playoffs, and he performed. Um. At the eight spot, and I'm going to do one more check to make sure I don't want to move this guy that I forgot up another spot. Uh, let me do this. Search him up. I got to check stats. We're going to take a quick pause here. Sorry. Okay. After further review, we're going to keep it how it is. I'm not going to move the guy I forgot up one more. So, at number eight, the man I forgot until the beginning of the show, Paul George PG-13. Uh, he's got his own podcast now. Great podcast. If you want to listen to him, um, 24 points per game, six rebounds, five assists, 45% from field, 37% from three played 56 games. So he played over half, which is my criteria for good enough, right? In the modern NBA, you have to look at how many games some dudes are playing. Like Paul George last season played 31, uh, there are some other seasons in here where he played six, 48. Uh, 56 games is good for Paul George because I think he's one of those guys in the league that just gets hurt all the time. Um, but he put up good stats, right? And the the Clippers, they always perform, right? Obviously, the playoffs, it was a bit rough this year, right? They he, Did Paul George play in the playoffs this year? I don't believe he did. Let me check real quick. Yeah, no, Paul George did not make an appearance in the playoffs this year. Um, so, again, that's another thing that's I think is keeping him here on this list. And I, I honestly can't believe I even forgot about him. I think originally I thought I put him in the shooting guards list, but he is listed as a small forward. Um, so, yeah, we'll throw him here at eight. And it's just when you watch – Paul George play it just looks effortless uh, he's one of the most fun players to watch in my opinion it's just because it's his game is so smooth it's it's just clean it's it, it looks he makes it look so easy he makes it look like anybody can walk on the court and do it but yeah I think everybody above the list I I my, like this is a hard decision for me because I had to make it so quick um but yeah I think I'm gonna keep him here I think he deserves here. I think he deserves being the top 10, period. Uh, yeah, real solid season for Paul George. He did the best he could. Uh, of course, if he would have been there in the playoffs, who knows what happened. I mean, that's the whole entire story of this Clippers team. Hopefully, we can see next season. I want to see with these new rules how the Clippers are actually going to play because obviously you can't load manage two players at the same time. So I'm really curious on what the Clippers are going to do specifically because they always seem to be load managing both of these guys. So we'll see. Um, but yes, Paul George is who I have at the eight spot. Moving on to number seven. Um, I am going to throw DeMar DeRozan here. Now, 
Demar, I think he had a great season. Um, obviously, it was a down year from last year, which he was an MVP candidate. I don't think Demar is ever going to get there again. Last season was incredible for him, but to be thirty three and still playing at this level with his kind of game, it it really just impresses me. Um, the Bulls finished tenth in the Eastern Conference, forty and forty two. They missed the playoffs and they lost in the plan, I believe. Um, but DeMar DeRozan was there, right? He had a great season, played 74 games, which, again, is impressive for a dude his age. It's it's rare you see kind of careers like this, right? Uh, Toronto, 27 points per game, gets traded to the Spurs, drops down to 21 points per game, 22, 21, back to Chicago, jumps up to 28 points per game and is an MVP candidate at the age of 32. Now, Obviously, this season wasn't that. And DeMar DeRozan's game, I think next season is going to take a huge hit because I don't know how much longer this guy can just keep taking two dribbles and pulling up a fadeaway from mid-range or catching in the post and pulling a fadeaway from the post. Like, he does, he has such an old style game and it's really fun to watch, but it's, I don't know how long he can, can can maintain this level of it, right? I don't know how long he can contain scoring 24 points per game at it. He's shooting 50% from the field, which is incredible from just mid-range of shots, like 32% from three, which is actually very good for DeMar DeRozan. I believe it is the second, it is, it's the, sorry, no, the third highest in his career. This is the third highest three-point percentage he's ever shot. Um, But yeah, I think DeMar had a good enough season to make this list. He had a good enough season to make the Bulls uh, just one game below 500 team. But yeah, I think next year is going to be very tough and a very decision, uh, a very decisive season, sorry, for DeMar DeRozan. Which leads us into our number six spot, which I have the new NBA champion, Michael Porter Jr. Now, that statement right there, the NBA champion, is mostly why he's on this so high right he wouldn't be at number six if he didn't have that championship to his name but he does right and the stats aren't as impressive as the guys behind him 17 points five rebounds one assist 48 percent from three 41 uh, sorry 48 percent from the field 41 percent from three um known as a black hole man you passing the ball and the shots going up you know it 100 percent of the time he ain't passing but when it came to it he went in the playoffs. He shot 42% from the field, 35% from three, 13 points, eight rebounds, two assists, uh, half steal, half block. It was a real impressive season from him, and he just played his role perfectly. He did everything that he needed to do to the T, and that's what, to me personally, made him deserve uh, the, the, five, the six spot. Sorry, the six spot. I'm messing up a lot today. I apologize. Um, but, yeah, I, it was a little better than DeMar DeRozan's season. I think I credit a lot of that, the playoff success. Uh, he played 62 games, which is good for Michael Porter Jr., considering how many back problems he's had in his career. Nine games played last year, 61 games played his sophomore year, and 55 games played his rookie year. So this is the most games he's ever played in a single season. And that is another accomplishment for this guy who came into the draft like – are we should we take a chance in this guy? I mean, he's always going to have back problems and he's had what, two, three back surgeries? Um I really respect him for going on the court and helping the Denver Nuggets win the championship and that for me is why he deserves a 6 spot. Moving on to number 5 is where we have the main man, the ex-Laker, Brandon Ingram. Um Now I will admit um, he only played 45 games, which, again, I said before, 42 games above is if you play more than half the games, that's where I start thinking, hey, you did a good job this season. Um, Brandon Ingram played 45, uh, 25 points per game, five rebounds, six assists. The New Orleans Pelicans were 16th in the league, so basically dead middle. Um, and ironically, that's where I have Brandon Ingram on this list, dead in the middle. Um, 48% from the field, 40% from three. He just had a really good season, in my opinion. Like, it was just solid. Um, 
there's no there there was really no negative side to the season, right? Because what did this team have going for it? I think they're still trying to find their identity. They're still trying to find a way to get their full team healthy. And I think um, what happened the other day, I think Trey Murphy even tore his ACL. And who knows if he's going to make a return to the court or when his timetable is. Who knows if Zion's going to return to the court at all. So it's really like these guys are kind of playing with loose ends and they don't really know what to do. Like they, if they should push to make the playoffs without those guys, if they should – not try as hard as they can and maybe try to get more picks and stock back up on these on this draft capital but it's i i think it's still a really good season for brandon ingram personally he took 19 shots a game uh this was career high in field goal percentage sorry i apologize his third year in the league he shot 49 percent. this is 48 percent um but he took six more shots per game um this is really, I think, a very good stepping stone season for Brandon Ingram. And I think next season, if these guys get their whole entire team healthy and if they find a way to play more than more than half the games together, like CJ, uh, B.I., uh, Zion, even Jonas Valanciunas. Like, I mean, Jonas played 79 games a season. But if they can get all these guys to the court on the same time and they can keep them on the court – I think this team can be scary. Like it's, it's the talent is there. They just need to put it together. And I think Brandon Ingram is still gonna want to be that number one guy in this in that system. And I think he can succeed at it. If I'm being honest with you, um, which brings me to my four spot. Now, this this area I had a little bit iffy too, right? Because this whole one through six. Even 1 through 7, you can include DeMar in there. But this whole 1 through 6, 1 through 7 was so hard to decide. And I think, I don't, I don't, it's it's hard to decide actually what, what was the deciding factor, right? I think it was just the stats. It, it, it's just a combination of everything. Playoff performance took a lot into account, which is why this guy is fourth. Um, and that's Kawhi Leonard. Okay, he played 52 games this season, which for Kawhi is incredible. Kawhi Leonard played 52 games this season. How much more can we expect of him, right? Um, he averaged 23 points per, 24 points per game, 23.8. I round up here. 6.5 rebounds, so seven rebounds, and four assists per game. 51 percent from the field and 42 percent from three. It, Statistics wise, incredible season. I mean, it's it's classic Kawhi. He plays enough games to get them into the playoffs. He performs in the playoffs, and they end up getting bounced. I mean, in the two games that he played in the playoffs, right? Think about this: thirty-four points per game. He had a block, a half a block. Sorry, two steals, six assists, and seven rebounds a game. In the two playoff games he played, if Kawhi Leonard played that entire series, I think the Sun that the Clippers win that series without Paul George, and that's crazy to say because Kawhi just played out of his mind, um, and it's it's really sad to see. It is sad to see because the one thing that everybody has wanted for the entirety of this era of Clippers is to see them both healthy and see them both performing. And they can't they can't figure that out. But Kawhi Leonard still had such a good season, especially in the playoffs. And the playoff performance is what won him um, the four spot for me personally. Um, as we move on to the three spot, this one's a little bit different because this guy did not have good playoff performance. Um, in fact, I believe that they got bounced in the first round. I will double. I, yes, they did. They did get bounced in the first round. In fact, they got swept they got dominated and if we're being honest i don't think this team really would have made it to the playoffs in general if it wasn't for Kyrie and durant um of course that may give you everybody a a hint at who i'm talking about and it also may shock you to see that i have mccall bridges at number three um now i think there's there's one reason here one singular reason why he is this high on my list. And this is just my own preference. 
And the fact that he played 83 games. There's 82 games in an NBA season. That means when he got traded from the Suns to the to the Nets, the Nets were a game behind the Suns. And Mikel Bridges played 83 games this season. All 83. And there was no signs of him slowing down. He was consistent in all 83. Now, if you look at his overall statistics for the season, 20 points, 4 rebounds, 3 assists, uh, 47% from the field, 38% from 3. Not impressive compared to Kawhi. Not impressive compared to Ingram, to Rosen, um, Paul George even. But let's we can split this up right into his two teams this season. The 56 games he played with the Phoenix Suns, he was a role player. He was a fourth option behind Paul CP3, behind Devin Booker, and behind DeAndre Ayton. He was there as the fourth option. And he was averaging 17 points, a block, a steal, three assists, four rebounds, and he shot what from three? He shot 38% from three and 46% from the field. That's as a fourth option. That is that is almost Michael Porter Jr.'s numbers, right? And he was doing this as the fourth option. Now, Michael Porter Jr. was doing that as the third option, right? But Macau Bridges was doing this as the fourth option. 17 points per game is incredible. As just a guy that plays defense on one end and then comes back down and spots up and hits a three, he might give you a pump fake and drive in and give you a layup. That was his whole, that was his whole motto in Phoenix. Fast forward to the Brooklyn trade. The 27 games he played with, Brook, played with Brooklyn, he averaged 26 points per game. He still had a block. He still had a steal, three assists, and four rebounds. 26 points per game from Macau Bridges is incredible. This guy took a leap in his game. He took went from 0 to 100. His role increased from 0 to 100. He went from the fourth option to the number one option, getting the ball so many times down the court. His percentages stayed around the same. Um, they went His three percentage went down. His field goal percentage went up. That goes, that goes with the touches, right? He was getting four shots, four three-pointers up per game in Phoenix, six per game in Brooklyn. 13 shots he was getting up in Phoenix, 19 shots he was getting up in Brooklyn. It's... It's super impressive from him for me. And this 26 points per game, playing 83 games, I think is really, really the two things that won it over. And if I'm being honest, next season, depending on how things shake out, Mikal Bridges could be one of this top two. And that's just... And that's just going off the little information we have of him playing, playing in Brooklyn. This full season that he's about to have in Brooklyn is going to be such a huge test for him and i think he's ready for all of it and i think honestly we could see another 82 game season out of mikhail bridges and i'm excited for it which moves us on to the top two now this was very very difficult and i think there might be some bias here for me personally but you know what it's my show if you have a different list that's fine go make your own podcast but at number two is where I have Jimmy Butler. Jimmy Butler, 64 games played, 23 points per game, 6 rebounds, and 5 assists. 54% from the field at small forward is incredible. 35% from three for Jimmy Butler is actually very good. Um, again, this was a season for He didn't have an all-star appearance this season, right? Because his play was down a little bit. Um, he didn't really care in the regular season. We all knew that he wouldn't really care. Why would he? He knows he's going to make the playoffs, and we saw what he did in the playoffs. In the playoffs, he averaged 27 points per game, six assists, six rebounds, two steals. Um, And they made it to the finals as an eighth seed, right? He's doing this all at the age of 33. And it's not the regular season stats at all that won me over for this. It is strictly the playoff performance that he had and that he willed this Heat team to that wins him over for me. Like, I can't even wrap my head around this. This team was in the plan, and they made the NBA Finals. They took a game. Now, they they almost got dominated. And I'm not going to lie to you. I think, I don't want to say it because is such a good coach, but I think he might have got outcoached a little. I feel like they're, he kind of stuck to their... Uh, 
kind of stuck to their scheme that they had throughout the season, which was that little zone that they had, a little bit of a press man. Um, and I think it was just not effective at all against Jokic. And they went into that zone against Jokic so many times, and he just tore it apart every single time. So, I mean, part of me wants to say that Spolster got a coach, but he's such a great coach that he never actually does. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about Jimmy. And honestly, if he would have had a better regular season, he's an easy number one for me. Um, But it's because of the poor regular season that he just he he misses out on the number one spot. Um, He misses it out to, of course, the king, LeBron James, age 38, 29 points per game, eight rebounds, seven assists. And it's what more can you say? The guy is 38 years old and he's he's averaging almost 30 points per game and he's willing to team to the seventh seed. A team that looked absolutely demolished at the beginning of the season. Like looked like we had no direction. Still brought this team to the playoffs and we made it to the freaking conference finals where he averaged 24 points per game in the playoffs, 10 rebounds and 6 assists. Um it's real impressive and honestly Another reason why I think LeBron takes it one spot for me is because of the playoff performance, right? Just like Jimmy, in the plan, led the team to the conference finals. The only thing is, the Lakers lost in the conference finals, and the Heat won in the conference finals. But the regular season numbers, for me, have it over Jimmy because LeBron put up 29 points per game for 55 games, willed this team from, what, the 12th seed we were for over half the season, a 0.3% chance of making the playoffs, and we made the conference finals. And I think that LeBron deserves to be the number one spot, and honestly, this might be his last season in the number one spot. We will see. But that is going to conclude the small forwards list. Thank you so much for listening. Um, And, yeah, we'll see you again next Friday. Peace.